I think it's creating a new kind of bio. That is, mm -hmm. I would call them a biz tech bio, right? But they're very much attuned to business outcomes. They have a degree of technology savvy, but they want you as a seller, as a provider of technology to abstract the unnecessary detail and really get to the heart of their business issue, which means take the complexity and simplify it. Make it real to them. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do, but how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of B2B EQ. Today's guest is a leader I can't wait to learn from. He helps high potential tech companies rapidly scale and grow into market leadership. He's a leader who balances strategy with operational execution and has enabled growth at some of the largest tech companies in the world. Currently VP and head of strategy and growth, digital infrastructure at Hitachi Ventara, Simon Nainen. Simon, great to have you. Great to be on, Tim. Very happy to be here, and thank you for that very kind introduction. Oh, well, with someone of your background, it is so fun to get to learn from you and understand kind of your journey. And, you know, speaking on that, let's start there. What has your journey been? And kind of give us a background, a little bit of, of kind of some of the roles and uh, different companies you've worked at prior to uh, Hitachi. Very good. Uh, happy to do that. So, uh, as you mentioned, I am currently... Head of Strategy and Growth at Hitachi Ventara. Uh, just to kind of place that for everyone, Hitachi Ventara is the data and digital infrastructure subsidiary of Hitachi Limited. Hitachi is, of course, a very well-known brand, number 29 on the list of the world's most innovative companies, apart from being one of the largest multi-billion companies in the world. Um, think of Hitachi Ventara as essentially being a Silicon Valley arm of Hitachi. And so in many ways at the forefront of that innovation when it comes to digital. So my role is strategy, growth, innovation, transformation. Uh, but before that, uh, for many years, I was with Deloitte Consulting as a management consultant. Um, and, you know, I grew up kind of in that system working, you know, went from running projects to owning key parts of accounts to kind of running multiple accounts at the same time to then building and you know, maintaining large pipelines and key customer relationships. So that experience in the field, it was very interesting when I had to then four years ago, four and a half years ago, when I moved to Hitachi, bringing that field experience into so-called corporate, right, into a very, very much a strategy and operations role. There were many things about that transition that were interesting that I'm sure we're going to talk about, right? But as, as an example, uh, consulting, selling is all about, you know, leading with services, leading with a long-term customer relationship. And now I find myself in a company that is known for its product. How do we fuse those, you know, the, those, those best kinds of thinking together, right? And how do we actually uh, help elevate, uh, I guess, a long-term view of the company to say, where are we going to be in the future? How do we get there? How do we build customer relationships that are long and lasting? So uh, when you reached out to me uh, regarding this podcast opportunity, I was very excited because I love talking about that stuff. Well, and I'm excited to have you because someone who's involved both in the sales and delivery side and has seen both and had to, to manage both, it's a different perspective. Coming from a marketer myself, a lot of it is go to market and, and pre-sales. Right. We've seen the marketing role expand a ton into yeah. everything of full customer life cycle, renewals, yeah. upsells, right. most enterprises, their growth is coming from that, right? That's right? So really interesting to see your move from field to corporate. What's your take on, you know, shifting the, the concept of product selling to solution selling like we've seen in SaaS and how a lot of technology companies have moved that way? That's right. How do you work on that? How do you change the dynamic in a sales culture to get there? No, absolutely. So first of all, I'll say, you know, the, the heritage of Hitachi, what Hitachi has been known for, it's a 110 year old company, right? What Hitachi has been mm -hmm. known for is really solid products and IP, right? So mm -hmm. 
like unquestionable, unbreakable stuff. And that kind of characterizes uh, Hitachi Vantara. The core of it is a storage and infrastructure business. The IP that we create is really solid. So it's very easy, for example, to kind of like go out into the market and say, I have a solid product for you. Or the product has gone through the next iteration, right? We, we've just released, you know, a new box. Here's a box. See what you can do with it. And that's a very different kind of selling conversation than to say, hey, Mr. Customer, what are your needs? What's top of mind for you? What's keeping you up at night, right? What are the things that you're really struggling with? And, you know, maybe if we work together, we can come up with a solution that actually meets your needs and the box doesn't become the conversation. The customer needs and customer outcomes become the conversation. I think that's, you know, shift number one, it is just an up leveling of the conversation itself and down leveling off we have something for you as opposed to we can achieve an outcome together. I think the second thing is, uh, you know, the idea, this is really powerful, at least in my world, the idea of an ecosystem, which means yeah. our tradition, at least Hitachi's tradition has been, you know, we have fantastic products. And so everyone knows and works with the name Hitachi. But when we actually think of how the world is evolving and all the pieces that, that come together, it is impossible for anyone to go the road alone. No customer can choose one vendor that meets all their needs. They need to work with an ecosystem. And so as a supplier, as a partner, I want to bring, in terms of a solution, the best ecosystem that can help meet the customer's need, right? So I think it's a whole now shift in thinking, which is this is both on the corporate side and on the field side, deciding what our ecosystem is going to be that best addresses the challenges that we see in the world but also when we have the conversation with the customer, we're not having a one-to-one -one conversation, we're having a group conversation, right? And we're coming to a decision that works best for the customer, but bringing all the necessary levers to bear. So I think that's the second thing. And I think the third thing that kind of connects to the first is, when you start speaking about outcomes, it actually helps us configure, you brought up the idea of software as a service, right? And X as a service is kind of like, we talk, we talk about it in our world because there's infrastructure as a service, data as a service, many other things yes. as a service. Um, it's basically saying it allows us to have a lot more creativity in terms of how we structure deals, how we actually are able to say, hey, customer, here's where you're at today. And we know this is the outcome that you're trying to achieve. Can we sell, can, can, can we have a conversation based on impact where we both mutually invest, we both take on risk at the same time, and depending on the customer achieving outcomes, we get paid. We don't get paid until the customer actually achieves their outcomes. That is actually, you know, it's a very bold and brave and risky idea from a vendor perspective, mm -hmm. but that allows us to actually more deeply dive into, you know, who the customer is, knowing the customer, knowing where they're at, and then investing in their success. What that also means is that we move past a very Hey, there's a transaction up front. I, I sell you the box. I sell you the IP. And that's when you're off on and running on your own. Instead, this is a lifetime journey. This is a journey that we're going to do together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As you had said in our, our call before this, you know, the conversation you were having five years ago is no longer the conversation you're having right. today. I, I right. loved that statement. What's it like to sell through change? In your role, what's it like for your teams? Dive into that a little bit. Hmm. There's so many angles to it. So maybe the way I'll tackle this question is maybe give a give give a sense to to you and to your audience on what is the change that I'm talking about. Like like I said, you know, five years ago versus now, mm -hmm. and then I'll talk about how you know why this mattered in terms of how we navigated through it. So a few years ago, Hitachi Vantara was going through some serious let's call it soul searching, right? And I have no problem yeah. sharing this, right? But it is basically saying, you know, as cust uh, with data being the fuel of the future and where businesses, you know, it essentially is what is going to power businesses going forward. People came to the conclusion at that time that maybe spending so much time thinking about, you know, faster storage boxes and, and all of that stuff is not really the conversation we need to be in. We need to be in position and customer outcomes, which by the way is the right conclusion. But it was almost like we were making a pretty dramatic pivot from being a storage company to being like a data and insights company. And drawing that connection between point A and point B is not just hard to do from an internal guts of the business perspective, but just think about a seller who knows how to sell storage. Yeah. 
How do you move that seller to selling insights, to selling outcomes, to selling data? Right. Many, many, many things had to change. And so as a company, you know, I'm going to cut through a lot of the uh, the many stages we went through. There were some forward steps. Uh, sometimes it felt like, you know, three steps forward, one step back and a lot of like sideward movements. But we changed many things during that time. And I feel like right now we're heading absolutely in the right direction with people starting to come together. But just as a summary, right, um, we mm -hmm. changed our go to market model, uh, for example. Uh, we were previously structured by GEO, right, which is America's APAC and MIA, right? These, th this is our primary way of going to market. We change it to a way in which we can focus on sales motions, right? So there are customers that require a more hands-on, white glove concierge kind of like, you know, call it a very direct approach. There are other customers that- Like your tier to one, market. yeah. Tier one, exactly, right? And then we have our commercial motion. Not that these customers are less important, but this is where we bring in more and more of the power of our ecosystem to bear with partners and distributors and resellers and all of that kind of helping with that, right? So that was change number one. Change number two is um, given the sales motions, we wanted to make sure that everyone had the right internal pod kind of ecosystem around them but then we're executing with the right discipline. So we introduced, and I know we're gonna talk about this more, right? A culture of metrics, yeah. and tracking productivity and driving you know, uh, tools that will help with increased engagement and knowing where everyone's at, our internal people, so that they can get more effective in you know, executing that journey. The second, the, the, the next part of it was basically what I would call you know, solution selling, cross portfolio selling. Uh, Hitachi Vantara itself is not just one thing, it's a few different things. Outside of storage, we have services, we have solutions, we have software. But then if you think of the broader Hitachi ecosystem itself, um, so many different you know, applications and ways in which we engage with customer, the magic in terms of how we create value is being able to kind of sell across our portfolio. That really is, call mm -hmm. it synergy, call it what you will, but there's a tremendous amount of untapped opportunity when we're able to say, hey, I've got a data infrastructure capability here and I've got a real customer who needs their trains to run on time. Can I actually connect these two together to make sure that the rail industry is able to run on time on the basis of a powerful data infrastructure? This ability to actually see connections, to connect the dots became a huge thing, right? And again, you're opening people's eyes up a little bit. You're asking them to do things that are unusual for them. You're asking them to be, to have conversations with a new set of people, right? And to do, uh, to, to structure deals and do things in a way that they've not done before. And that requires a lot of handholding, requires a lot of training. It requires a lot of, you know, different kind of conversations. Overall, this was like taking a salesperson's average skill set from here to here and then to here and then kind of working with them along that journey. Right. And of course, I think the other piece of it, as I mentioned earlier, is that impact selling, which is selling CapEx versus selling OpEx, right? All of that mm -hmm. stuff. Somehow this is like, you, you think of all of this happening in the space of five years, too much change, right? It's, People buckle under the It's first. a ton of change. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, you know, I, the, the goal, it's like the goalpost constantly moving. And I, I'm just thinking you've right. got the internal change organizationally. You talked about how the organizational structure right. and the pods changed, but you also talk about the individual seller's expectations. That's right. That's right. I, oh, there's an interesting absolutely. study. Yeah. Yeah. There's an interesting study around what buyers are looking for. And yeah. you hit on it from the seller's vantage point, which is buyers have said, look, most sellers yeah. show up from That's a product right. discussion, knowing the speeds and feeds really, really well. Right. What they don't come knowing is my business, right. my needs, my right. concerns, right. the the subtle intricacies, and how we're going to get there together and build trust. Yeah. How did you see that come to life? What were some of the seller skills that yeah. came as very apparently, hey, I have to really double down on not necessarily the product knowledge, right. but this business acumen? And how did you face that? That's a really important question. I think that's the heart of it, right? Because sometimes we can get so involved, mm -hmm. I think as you're getting the sense of, right, in, in navel gazing and our internal capability that we forget that ultimately yeah. this all starts from the customer, right? Yeah. We are changing because customers are changing and because the market is changing, right? So you hit on a couple of these things already. And I know in previous uh, episodes of the podcast, this is a topic you talk about a lot, but I'll bring maybe yeah. one or two points of that to life in the context of our own products and selling. 
Um, we are a technology company. We operate in the tech space. And I think technology, the problem is, well, the good and the bad, is that it, it's evolving so rapidly. Stuff that applied five years ago doesn't even apply today. Big trends, mm-hmm. macro trends that we were tracking even in 2019 are not the same trends that we're talking about today. Suddenly, Gen AI has become the conversation. Suddenly, like uh-huh. in our world, hybrid cloud and repatriation and all of these things are new things that we weren't as much talking about several years ago, right? And so that's number one. If you think of the parallel of that with sellers, I think we're reaching that, you know, that generation has come into the workforce that grew up as digital natives, right? And so a mm-hmm. lot more comfort with technology and with ways of working and ease of, but. It's digital natives in the sense that there's a baseline understanding of like, there's complexity under the surface that other people are caring about and that we don't need to worry about. I care about what I do with technology and the outcome. So now it's like both in, inside our workforce and at customers, everyone has gravitated mm-hmm. towards an outcome kind of approach, which means if you combine these things together, you basically have tech, somewhat tech savvy people, outcome driven people dealing with a world that is rapidly evolving by technology, I think it's creating a new kind of buyer. That is, Mm -hmm. I would call them a biz tech buyer, right? But they're very much attuned to business outcomes. They have a degree of technology savvy, but they want you as a seller, as a provider of technology to abstract the unnecessary detail and really get to the heart of their business issue, which means take the complexity and simplify it make it real to them. You know, we used to have uh, the tradition of our company, the legacy of our company was speaking to the office of the CIO. We're not Mm -hmm. having that conversation anymore. The CIO is now a business partner to line of business owners. They are not having independent conversations. They're having it together. We need our people, for example, we need people that are selling to the banking industry to know banking in and out, not to know storage for banking, right? We need our people that are in the Uh manufacturing space to be manufacturing experts, right? And so um, I think both that change is happening both on the buyer side and also our side, but it's like, I'm very encouraged about where the market is going, but I feel like we are at that inflection point. And a lot of people have a hard time crossing that gap. We've got to help them. Companies have got to not assume that things will just happen trainings, engagement, conversations, constantly putting things in front of people that kind of alert them to the fact of like, alert them to critical business issues and trends, but also kind of constantly push us forward, right? And create a, I think this happens by a culture and then a vision and a, like a motivation that excites people, right? If they're excited, all of the other stuff will follow from there. Anyway, that's a lot of different threads, but I think, you know, hopefully that makes sense. I'll add one thing if you don't mind. Uh, which Absolutely. Is, uh, which is the concept of an athlete. Um, I yeah. I think we know what this means, but I'll explain it, right? Which is when when we want to build our sales force as athletes, what that means is these are people that have not just like the discipline and conditioning as, as athletes do, but very often these athletes are multidisciplinary. They, you know, They specialize in one area, but they can do other things. A sprinter can also do long jump. They can be trained to do high jump. They can do a, they they can be a triathlete or a decathlete. They can apply their skills in different areas. It's very important to actually think of our people like that and invest in our people like that because number one, the ability to connect the dots across various things will be super important as a critical success factor going forward. But secondly, as technology changes, the ability of our people to adapt, to change the conversation, to kind of migrate a skill set in a certain direction, I think, you know, is ultimately what makes or breaks companies. So hopefully that makes sense. It, it does. You, you're taking me exactly where I was going to ask you next, because I was seeing two two views. I'm seeing the specialized athlete, right? The the quarterback, the right. person that is is totally honed in on, on one right. skill set. That's right. But then I also see what you're saying, which is kind of the master of none, but That's a right. very broad player. Right. Is yeah. there a position for both yeah. in today's modern move or which one would you play to? Yeah, no, it's a, listen, I, I think that your question kind of answers itself, but I'll say the obvious thing. So the market yeah. 
again, broader context, the market keeps moving. If you look at macro trends from generalization to specialization and generalization and specialization. Yeah. Right. And we may sure. be just swinging the pendulum again, but I will say absolutely to your point for the long term, those two things are never going to go away. Right, you need to identify and build both kinds of skill sets in your company. You need the people that can be deep, deep, deep. You need the people that are called on in case stuff breaks that no one else knows how to fix. If you don't have that that mm-hmm. kind of person, at least you know where to find them in your ecosystem. But yeah. a more like an emerging skill set more today than it was say ten years ago and twenty years ago is that cross functional discipline, the connect the dots people the broad people, right? So I think companies mm-hmm. have a hard time. Companies often treat this, treat, treat this as either or. I think the right way is to kind of figure out an operating model that makes both work together. And that makes both conversations like you need these people to talk to each other. You need them to educate each other. Yeah. You can't really become broad unless you're speaking to all the people that know the deep. And and to that point, how have you seen this like feedback loops and kind of that cross communication? Because to your, you said, you know, deals are getting more complex. Not right. one seller can maintain that whole deal. It's taking a team right. on both sides, right? There's the buying team and the selling team Absolutely. now. Yeah. But how do you get those feedbacks or how have you seen that work well in organizations? Yeah, both at your time at Deloitte and then maybe now more in the technology space. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, the, I, I think... The answer to this is many, and I guess I can speak. This is a topic that's close to my heart because it ties to the idea of innovation. Uh, so uh-huh. feel free to cut me short if I go too long, but I'll, I will think I'll try to hone in on a few points. Number one is the uh-huh. idea that the best innovation always happens at the edge, um, which means ideas are coming up every day in individual conversations between a salesperson and their customer and between salespeople and between a variety of people that are basically sitting at the edge that I'm talking about. In contrast to the core, which is the corporate planning, it's the corporate side of the organization. Very often companies lock R&D teams in a room and say, come up with the next big idea, right? And that's not how it works, right? Real innovation is in ideas at the edge. And I think we're trying to make sure that culturally, but also in routine practice, our salespeople see themselves as seeders of innovation. They are the ones that will originate the idea that ultimately become the future of the company, right? So what we need to do is facilitate that pipeline that says, how do you salesperson, when something comes up in conversation, identify that as an idea, put it into the system, talk to the R&D people, talk to the deep people, right? Get those ideas then percolating. How do we then kind of create structured ways of prioritizing trading stuff off, vetting ideas against each other and kind of making some choices over there. How do we also kind of do the reverse, which is I need more of my corporate people that are sitting in this core in the conference room, including the R&D people. How do we get them out into the field as tech Mm -hmm. evangelists to say, guys, here's the art of the possible. Let's use that as a base to kind of like drive more innovation. And then I think, uh, you know, one concept that I've seen work here really effectively is the idea of you know having advisory forums of customers and partners, right? Groups of people that are cons- like you identify them culturally and you know in terms of like the personalities of people, people that really want to engage, people that are full bursting, full of ideas, and they just are happy to talk to you if only you tap into them, right? So form that group, regularly talk to them, engage, engage, engage. And, you know, before you know it, you're a more innovative company than you were before. I think the model that you just laid out there for people of, of getting your ear in from the boardroom or from the, the corporate side out to the street, out yeah. to the front line conversations, getting yeah. more people out there some way. My, my follow-up, two questions is, sure. there's got to be benefits to that and challenges with that being a big brand <laughs> I'm curious to dissect that so that's my first oh, one. i'll wow. leave that right. so I, when you're when you're trying to get that feedback and trying to get that feedback up the chain yeah because i think small companies very agile i've been at a lot of companies in the the one to 15 one to 10 million range yeah very agile but um, this yeah. is not the same same challenge it that it, it's an excellent question and i think you know the first time I heard when I was joining Hitachi and I heard the statistic that Hitachi 
as big a company as it was, was in the top 30 most innovative companies in the world. I was like, yeah. that's actually fascinating. What what's the what's what's yeah. what's the driver for that? What's the secret sauce behind that? Right. And I think it is uh, it, 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 it's a couple of things. I think to your point, innovation at scale tends to be a buzzword, but there is actually a secret to making innovation at scale happen. Right. It is incentive. Number one, I think, incentivizing ideas from the field in a company like Hitachi, the field is thousands and thousands of people. Yeah. Right. And here's the problem with those people is that you've given them big targets and they are very busy doing what they're doing in terms of their business as usual work. Right. So mm -hmm. to ask them to kind of participate in innovation is kind of asking unusual things of them. Not everyone has the time to do it. I will tell you this, though, that in all the parts of your organization, the field has the most energy. Like the sales salespeople yeah. are the bounciest people you'll ever come across. Right. <laughs> but it, 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 it <laughs> this is to that, true. Yes. It to that because of the the what the, the concept I talked about before, which is innovation at the edge, they're also they also have access to the right kind of information. Yep. So the starting point is basically saying basic facilitation that essentially says insert the right people into those edge conversations, motivate people, give them the incentives to kind of bring information back and seed additional conversations for the future. And I think Hitachi does that quite well, all right? Um, Hitachi also uses this word co-creation a lot, right? And I think uh, it, it's, it's a common phrase, but let me just dive into it a little bit, right? Co-creation means that mm -hmm. we're not as a company coming up with innovation that we then say, hey, who's the taker for this innovation, right? Rather, it's what we're saying yeah. is our roadmap and what we work on is absolutely influenced by and jointly developed by our customers and our partners. So with, for example, we would go to a partner and we say, and this is, this is not a technology alliance partner, this is a regular partner, it's out in the field, but we would say, hey, we'd like to work mm -hmm. together with you on, like, you know, you talk to us about some really interesting idea. Let's co-develop that together. They put something in it, we put something yeah. in it, we build something together, and immediately you've got something that is market relevant because these guys, are in the market and they're relevant, right? So it, it's like you're tapping also then into a, you know, into the power of your ecosystem. So I'm not just saying tap into the energy at the edge, tap into the power of the ecosystem, right? And then I think uh, fundamentally, I think the other piece of it is uh, you need to show commitment at the core, right? Um, mm -hmm. Hitachi spends billions of dollars of innovation. I think uh, compare in, in terms of R&D and innovation, Hitachi spend percentage wise is well above many of its peers, right? And that represents a commitment to basically saying, we don't care that some like nine out of 10 innovations may actually result in failure, which means never sees the light of day, right? But what mm -hmm. we're doing is we're committing to make sure that that engine keeps running that engine keeps running, right? And then, you know, so eventually, like the best ideas are going to find their way through. It takes it takes deep pockets to do that. It takes a company with heritage, <laughs> right, and history, but also yep. a company that's viable for the long term, right, to be able to commit to it and say, it doesn't matter that it's millions of dollars are being invested here, right? This is not going to help, not just going to help us and our customers and partners for the long term. It's going to help the world at large. When it's it's so it's solving big problems. I think the what I've looked at in in my past of enterprise and and what I've been coached on is always if you're going to sell an enterprise deal, you have to solve a big problem. That's correct, right? Yeah, you you can't come in doing small things, and I think that's where a lot of the point solutions and a lot of innovation in tech yeah. has maybe failed to cross the chasm because that small point solution challenge that they're solving gets overlooked. I think of of AI. Right, right now, I mean, the That's whole right. world right. of how we sell and go to market has changed with generative AI. That's correct. Curious your thoughts with the pace of change and Ooh. how crazy it is. And, and that, uh, you know, we've all heard the quote that it's never going to get slower. Right. Where's your future with AI in, in the sales space? And how do you see AI playing into that? Mm. <laughs> hot, hot topic for sure, right? Yeah, um, I yes. uh, in, interestingly enough, and I want to keep because AI can go in fifty dif different directions. Uh, I'll keep this focused yes. on, on on the sales side of it, right? Because 
AI has, mm -hmm. I believe, as many other people believe, that a, a generative AI is probably one of the most transformative technologies of this next generation, right? And if you're not thinking about it, and I know many companies are thinking about it because there's hype around it, but if you're not thinking seriously about it and holistically about it, you're probably losing out, right? So stay on top of it is first piece of advice. I think uh, what's interesting, Tim, is that uh, even in the last two to three weeks, there have been at least a dozen reach outs from random people in the field writing to me and asking me, hey, Simon, how do I talk about AI to my customers? It's, it's interesting, right? Because these are management people, these are regular salespeople, but they all are asking, they're saying, the customer's asking for it, I need to have an answer. Now the customer may actually be asking because they have a specific question, which is, how is your storage and infrastructure going to support AI, which absolutely we have to have an answer to. But the customers are actually looking, I think in terms of like, we don't know what to do with AI. Like have a conversation with me about how my own business can evolve with AI, not about how your storage boxes can use AI, but how the future of AI is going to guide us all and can we all kind of work together to make that happen. So that's kind of like a general statement, right? But I think the tools that we need to put in the hands of our salespeople is essentially, I would say a combination of like the real world here and now, here's how AI is influencing our current products and our roadmap but also more generally thought leadership and directions to say, we believe as Hitachi or as other companies, mm -hmm. right? We believe here's the direction the world is moving in the form of AI, provocatively making statements about where that's going to go and then being able to say, Mr. Customer, you need to be thinking about X, Y, and Z, and it may have nothing to do with the product I have to offer you, but we need to be at the front of that conversation, right? So. Number one, I want to arm my people. I want to arm our salespeople with the tools they need to have the right conversation. The roadmap will mm -hmm. follow. The conversation is what starts, right? And I think that you, we talk a lot, you used at least a couple of times in the conversation, this thing of cross, crossing the chat, the chasm, right? Or, you know, the, 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 the uh -huh. tipping point, tipping points, the critical mass. That yeah. happens after conversations yeah. reach a certain level of, you know, uh, momentum and credibility, right? And then it's backed up by the solution. So um, I know that's a little bit of a general answer. I can answer it more specifically from my industry perspective, but I don't think that's what the salespeople are looking for right now. I, I think you said it perfectly. You know, to distill down what I heard from you is salespeople, now is your chance that's correct. to be informed, to that's understand right. what it's going to do to the industries you serve. Right. And to position yourself as that trusted advisor, because everybody wants to know something finally. Right. right. I'll, I'll say this, right, which is connecting to your point. This, this may sound like a trite cliche, yeah. but it's this whole distinction between what's now and what's next. Too often, we spend our time mm -hmm. talk, in conversations about what's now. I think the prerogative of this time and space is basically having conversations about what's next. Which, and that requires a set of things to be very tactical. It requires you to kind of like follow the news, read reports, look at what the leading minds are saying, right? Always try to draw connections on that to say, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for my customer, right? Ask the customer not what they are trying to do today, but where are they going five years from now? And how can we together work on that? So that, that I think is where... Like if you were to sum up this entire, like, what is it, 30, 40 minutes of discussion, I would basically yeah. say that's what, uh -huh. that's what our salespeople need to focus on. Think ahead, think ahead, work back, right? I think that's the, uh, that's, that's the skill that everyone needs now, yeah. I, I love that. I think becoming a trusted advisor means being that leading thought. And to your point, too often, a lot of us are playing catch up or trying to sell the widget and not sell the idea of where where the the ball is going to go next. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, uh, Simon, I, it's spot on and, and great to great to kind of go through those topics. Now, I feel a privilege because we've gotten to learn from you for the last half yeah, an hour or so. You. But I want to learn a little bit more about you. I want to go back to your journey. You know, if you were just getting into Deloitte, and uh, you know, a little bit of uh, hindsight's twenty twenty. Right. If you could, if you could tell yourself then, you know, some yeah. advice, what would you have for maybe that next generation coming up? Hmm. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> this is a good, 
sit in the armchair and take a, a long, a long thought. Yeah. Um, uh huh. I, I think, I think the, the first and most important thing is kind of related to some of the themes we talked about, right? Which is number one, be a sponge. Um, don't assume that you know anything, right? Just absorb, absorb, absorb. And I think the reason is a lot of us starting out in our careers don't know exactly where we want to go. But even people like me who knew where we wanted to go had no clue where the world would change and eventually take us. I had no idea that I'd be sitting where I am today. Like if you ask, ask me to kind of rewind, right? But what I did do right uh, was be a sponge. I absorbed, absorbed information. I was, I think the most important thing that you can do is be an active learner, right? Look at information, absorb mm -hmm. it, see, right? And then I think contrast that with the idea that there's so much information overload, right? So I think as part of absorbing, it's not like saying there's information overload, so I'm going to draw some walls around myself, but develop a skill of basically sifting good information from bad and making good judgments based on good information. That would be one. The second would be as part of that, which is very related to that is seek out wise, wise mentorship. There is nothing that can be more helpful to your career, whether you're a salesperson or you're in finance or you're in you know, marketing or product or wherever else it is, right? I think uh, some, a lot of times decisions today are archetypes or made on archetypes of decisions that were made yesterday and the day before patterns, right? And I think the people that have been, that have had experience know and see and identify those patterns, right? And they can help kind of coach you through them. Pattern recognition, I think is a very important skill. And I think mentorship really, really helps that, by the way. What I just said, if you translate that into technology terms, is the core of what AI, generative AI, is all about, right? Pattern recognition, right? And being able to build on top of patterns, right? Uh, and I think the third thing is basically uh, have confidence. It's very easy to get overwhelmed in the middle of all of this, right? But confidence and a clear picture, even if your picture tends to change, you have a goal and you're setting your goal clear for yourself. Sometimes things can come in the way and take you left or right. For example, I moved across continents and countries. I got married in the, in the middle. I, had, I, I, I started building a family and every one of these things, including other changes in my career, took me down, you know, a left turn here, right turn here, a slight change in angle over here, right? But at every point, what kept me grounded was I had a clear vision of where I wanted to get to. I had to adjust that vision. I had to pivot. I had to make changes. But clarity of purpose always helped me kind of look ahead. So. I know that's kind of like general advice, but, and I know that may make me sound older than I really am, uh, but hopefully this no. is helpful to people that are getting started. <laughs> I think it is. I think it's helpful for people that are getting started, but also I think of CEOs and founders and people that are looking at even market conditions and yeah. saying, gosh, the timing or this or that. Right. This is all good advice for life. I think some, some definite wisdom there. And just to kind of learn a little bit more about you, you're in San Francisco Bay Area now, yeah. but you yeah. said you traveled and, and lived all over the world. Where are some places you've traveled and um, any recommendations for, for our audience <laughs> or places that just absolutely yeah. wowed you? Oh, no, absolutely. I, I, grew up, I grew up in India, which is a very, uh, I'll, I'll call it a, a very culturally rich and sen the sensory heaviness is, is very powerful in India. You cannot be in India and get bored. Uh, and I love it, right? I love going back. I was there recently and I carry a lot of that uh, energy and excitement, but that, you know, desire to connect with people and be, you know, to, to, to drive development and building an energy kind of around with me. So I, that, that I think is a huge part of who I am. I was keen to come here to the U S and work. Like I came here circumstantially. It was not like it was a dream of mine, but when I did come here, I found, I, I found a way mm -hmm. to kind of blend that kind of, you know, call it the emerging market energy and culture with process and rigor uh -huh. and discipline and, you know, never achieve less than a hundred percent, you know, and always, you know, never settle for anything less in the U S I lived kind of across, mm -hmm. 
I lived in, you know, Orange County and Los Angeles and Dallas and Atlanta and New Jersey and New York. And then I worked in Seattle and uh, several other places before coming back to the Bay Area. So I've had a little bit of taste of everything here. Uh, happy to be settled where That's I am, true. right? But I think one thing that's certainly kind of top of mind for me as I, uh, as, as I um, you know, look back at all of that movement is um, that, that's connected to the idea of, that I was a sponge, right? Um, if, every experience was exciting, no. you know, like, what do I learn? What do I, you know, how can I kind of make this part? And uh, I'm a little bit of like a global citizen, so I don't see myself now bound to any one country or a company or anything like that, right? My job here is now kind of like, <laughs> it may sound too grand, right? But I see myself as trying to make the world a better place wherever I am, yeah? I, I love it. And and what excites you, speaking of making the world a better place, what excites you about the future? Yeah, and actually I was, uh, this actually ties, I know I didn't cover it, but this ties very much to why I chose to join Hitachi in the first place. Hitachi does something called forecasting and backcasting, which is a simple innovation exercise. I'll describe it in brief terms, but basically they start by asking themselves the question of what is the world going to look like 50 years from now? What are the That's biggest it. challenges that the world is going to face? And we talk about climate change and we talk about uh, rapid urbanization. We talk about aging populations. We talk about uh, evolving technology and the inability of people to kind of keep up with that. Uh, we talk about a whole like poverty and a bunch of other things, right? And we talk, in this context, and if you work backwards, these are real problems that if they're not addressed by society and companies and individuals, we're all going to be left behind. We're all going to be the worse off. Yep. Hitachi wants to be, make sure that those top challenges of the world are its top things that it's addressing today. That's why it describes itself as a global social innovation business. You know, I was excited by the idea, right? So the things that I work on right now, I'm always kind of looking at, it's not what new dollars that can I create, but what kind of impact can I have? And that excites me, the idea of real world impact. Even as a consultant, sometimes you see as a consultant, you're kind of like a couple steps removed from real world outcomes, right? But mm -hmm. when I see tangible outcomes, for example, I'll give you a great example. For many yeah. years, I was associated with uh, technology that you currently see that has become standard in cars. Uh, for example, your infotainment system and your crash response. Like, have you been in one of these vehicles where when it crashes, it immediately calls a call center and there's help immediately yes. there within seconds, right? That's the kind of technology and use cases that I worked on. When I drive in those cars today, I'm like, that's amazing. I actually had a hand in making that happen. It's real world. It's helping save lives. It's helping people be productive. It's helping build convenience. So that's what excites me. Simon, I've loved hearing from you in how to take the technology and the innovation and to your last story, bring it into the tangible, bring right. it into the, the real life transformation of, of what's happening in our sales organizations and in global companies like Hitachi right. Ventana. So amazing to, to talk to you. Where can people get in touch? Where can they follow you on the journey if they want to learn more? Um, give our listeners some of those. We'll also have that down in the show notes as well so they can connect. Well, I, I, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that very much. Um, mm -hmm. And it's been a pleasure to talk to you as well. Um, I, I, As you can tell, these are topics that I am very passionate about. Yeah. Uh, in years, I've not lost that passion and I hope to stay this way. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, of course. Um, uh, that's my my the majority of where I guess you can find my social presence. I keep all the other private mm -hmm. stuff private. Um, but that being said, um, I do intend. I'll say this and hold myself to it. Uh, I look forward to uh, regularly publishing blogs on some of these topics and the, uh, the evolution of you know where the world is moving and how we can all as individuals be a part of it. Uh, so look forward to that coming out as well. And Simon, I look forward to staying in touch. We will share not only your company website, but LinkedIn with everybody on listening and more than anything, solving these big problems, leading through change. It, it has been just absolutely awesome to talk to you today and I appreciate the time. So thank you so much for, uh, for joining us on B2B EQ. Thank you, Tim. Thanks to all those that are helping with the podcast uh, and appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Look forward to the next time. Cheers. Thank you.
Right. And to our guests, um, this has been another exciting episode of B2B EQ. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. If you want to connect on anything on this or other episodes, make sure to listen wherever you get your podcast. Take care. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.